mindfulness was what really transformed absolutely mm. everything for me. And I can look back on some of those, even those really dark times and feel incredibly grateful in a, in a, in a strange way that, mm. that actually I had those experiences and that that brings a richness to my teaching, my ability to be able to really relate to people when they are in those lowest of places um, that I really value. Hello, I'm Sherry Jacobson, and this is Therapy Lab, a podcast dedicated to therapy, thought, and the art of mental well-being. In this episode, we are joined by mindfulness meditation teacher and author, Francis Trussell, to talk about how mindfulness can help overcome issues such as phobia, depression, and stress. Francis, hello. Hello. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to your beautiful home. I wonder if we can start off with a quick well-being check with yeah. you. How are you feeling today on a scale of 1 to 10? One being the lowest, ten being the highest. Okay. So it's really interesting from a mindfulness perspective because actually for from from a mindfulness mm. perspective, it's more about tuning into this ever-changing nature of our experience. Yeah. And so this sense yeah. that actually there, there won't be a whole day that's in anything. Yeah. And it's about accepting what is what is there and allowing the next moment to unfold as a result yeah. of that. Yeah. And so really I yes. suppose it's like what am I what am I carrying into this moment? Okay, well yeah. there's there's a little bit of nervousness because yeah. there are cameras. Yes. <laughs> yes. And there's a little yeah. bit of a train journey that I've just had or yeah. an apprehension. Yeah. But if I put those things down and tune into kind of what's underneath that, then uh, it's always gonna be a little bit higher up the scale yeah. when I put those yeah. things down. And yeah. so now is all yeah. good. I'm, I'm going to say a nine. Yes. <laughs> okay. So interesting though, isn't it? And we'll, we will, we will we'll mm. del delve deeply into the subject of mindfulness and ever-changing mood states and, mm. and, and feelings. Um, let's talk a little bit about what keeps you busy. What are you, what are you active with currently? So I'm so fortunate to be training a lot of people. Um, in recent years, mindfulness has become so much more uh, in public consciousness. Yes. And it's amazing when I first started teaching uh, just six years ago, there, it was a very kind of set type of people. There were lots of kind of middle-class white women who were had heard of mindfulness and were M mildly interested in what that might be about and now actually uh, it's incredible everybody is suddenly opening up to the possibility mm -hmm. of what being more mindful could mean for them mm -hmm. and um, and it's really expanded incredibly mm -hmm. so so l really lucky to do lots of group teaching lots mm -hmm. and lots of one-to-one -one work um, yeah, that's that's mm. keeping me very busy. That and a new book. So new book as well. A mm. second book. First book. First book. First, First book. book. Okay. So how did you get into mindfulness? What was the the journey for you into it? So I through a lot of anxiety, a lot of very dark periods of of depression, suicidal depression at times, and I had tried a whole host of things but for me mindfulness was what really transformed absolutely mm. everything for me and I can look back on some of those even those really dark times and feel incredibly grateful in a in a in a strange way that mm. that actually I had those experiences and that that brings a richness to my teaching, my ability to be able to really relate to people when they are in those lowest of places mm. um, that I really value. 
if you're happy to, if you're okay to discuss yeah. some of some of the issues that you you experienced, how how far back did did it start, and what was the what were your experiences around those difficulties? So I had depression from a very young age, mm -hmm. as as a child, had childhood uh, depression, a lot of questioning, really questioning, kind of why am I here? What's the point of it all? Um, which was was really difficult as a as a young child, um, but actually now I see that that was kind of this this search for insight and an awakening that was kind of waiting to happen. This kind of bubbling undertone of there must be more to life mm -hmm. than this. Actually, mm -hmm. that probably a lot of us experience this longing to find this sense of purpose in life and then when we don't feel in alignment with that can feel really rough really bumpy yeah. and i experienced a lot of that through my childhood through into my uh, teens and found a lot of escapism through um alcohol and drugs mm -hmm. and um yeah kind of led me along uh, along a a path of discovering different aspects and elements of uh, myself, but also um, the ways of, of being that could really help me live in, in this kind of more grounded, centred way that I found now. Mm. And in, in, your, in your more difficult periods, Describe to us what was it, what, what it was, what it was like, and you know how how it was for you. So, I think looking back, actually, the the brain can sometimes have this this way of kind of blocking lots of those, mm. lots of those memories, those really hard times mm. out. Um, but for me, I suppose my more recent kind of history of experiences of low mood and yeah. depression um, have taught me that actually it's so easy for us to get lost in this world of thinking and overthinking and rumination and and personally that is why discovering the real essence of mindfulness but learning to be able to to mm. sit back from those thoughts has been so helpful because when that heavy persistent negative thinking the critical voice kicks in and takes over it can take us to the the darkest of places mm. if if we believe that that voice is us and we believe mm. that we are all the terrible things that it is telling us mm. uh, that's a really hard place to be in and symptomatically so you you had a lot of you had a lot of negative thoughts in, in, or, or darker thoughts how how was it manifesting how was it impacting on your day-to-day -day functioning so I think as a child just periods of uh, anxiousness uh, mm -hmm. feeling easily upset and sensitive mm -hmm. and then that carried through into into my teens, acting out um, very disruptive behaviour at school. I must have been a complete nightmare to try and teach. Um, really playing out, I was very difficult, a very difficult teenager, very difficult for my parents. Um, was just a bit angry about being alive, really. A bit, um, why, why me? Why did I have to be here? Why does it have to be so difficult? Mm. Uh, a lot of, a lot of blame, a lot of lashing out, a lot of disruptive behaviour. Mm. Mm. Did you ever? Did you, have you given much consideration as to like root causes of it, or is it not something that you tended to focus on? It's more on kind of the, the changing of it. So, uh, interestingly, when I first came mm. to mindfulness, it was a real relief actually to not 
have this kind of backward focus yes. of kind of digging through it because yeah. therapy approaches that I'd had in the past were very much focused on, I felt raking through mm -hmm. lots of the things that I found very painful and that sense of it actually feeling worse rather than feeling better. Uh, and so for me, this enormous relief that we are where we are, how are we going to channel our power into this particular mm. moment so that the unfolding of the next chapter of our life is a better one? Uh, that was a real relief. But actually going further through the process, I attend a lot of retreats and actually a big part of that um, People might have this idea of a, a meditation mm -hmm. retreat being quite a relaxing thing, but actually when we create this space, a lot of that old buried stuff, kind of when it's ready, will bubble up to, to the surface to kind of be seen and, and processed. And, and that can be very painful. Mm -hmm. um, so it's been really interesting as part mm. of the journey over the last few years for some of that stuff to kind of arise but now for me to be ready to to, to actually see it and deal with it in a different way I think it's very important to kind of recognize that we're all this process in a world of processes mm. and actually where I am now I, I have regular therapy to, to process some of the, the things that are arising mm. and and aspects of my personality that I'm still carrying from being that frightened child mm. and that wounded person mm. or fearful of how people are judging me so I'd like to find out more about the therapy you're in um, obviously but also the retreats yeah did you do more than one and what was the nature of it so I do lots of retreats right. all of the and time. And you review retreats as well, is that I right? I do yeah. review retreats. It's kind of yeah. come about more recently. Mm -hmm. uh, my husband is pleased to say, as I'm going off on so many. But, um, but retreats are an incredible way for me to stay really rooted and connected. I think we have to... We've, got to, we've, we've really got to walk the talk when we're holding space for people and mm -hmm. coming at that from the right place is so important for me. So I go on all sorts of different retreats, but mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. uh, my personal flavour is Zen. I, mm -hmm. I love a Zen retreat mm -hmm. and I attend a lot of um, Zen enlightenment intensives where we work mm -hmm. quite uh, intensively yeah, yeah. on uh, on a koan, which is a, a spiritual question, which kind of points directly to a direct experience, and um, and they are really really wonderful for getting a getting a quick shift in in awareness and perception. Mm -hmm. So, to anyone who hasn't heard, hasn't come across Zen, mm. um, how would you describe it? What's the kind of format? What's the commitment? required so for uh, a zen intensive mm -hmm. yeah you can go on different lengths but ordinarily you'll do a, a three day so two mm -hmm. nights three days mm -hmm. uh, and you'll work in a dyad format mm -hmm. where um, you'll be sitting opposite different partners and so for instance i would say tell me who you are uh, and then for five minutes you would go into reflection and you would just speak whatever is arising and then the listening partner is just there to provide a very open non-judgmental presence where we, we try and have as, as little reaction or response as possible but we just allow this space for for the other person to be heard and then this swaps over uh, you're probably doing dyading for for a lot of hours a day uh, for, f over that intensive period but it is remarkable as we get better at mm. rather than thinking our way through it actually directly experiencing what is arising in that moment um, mm. it's amazing what gets worked through and um, yeah how we get to that direct experience of, of who we are and the nature of everything <laughs> and is it ongoing work do you recommend more than one or is it a one-off for for for, for some people, would you say once would be enough or is it something that you should top up on regularly? So uh, f uh, for a lot of people, they will go on one as a one-off, but mm. actually we, we tend to get 
the bug when we've experienced and we've had this direct experience and actually this lightning that happens from unloading the stuff that comes up along the way it's kind of um we use this uh, idea of digging for gold and as you dig all sorts of muck comes up on the shovel uh, but we see that that's not who we really are and we keep digging until we strike gold and actually mm. in that process the unburdening that that happens through that is remarkable so this feeling of kind of lightness and openness of connectedness that comes through after a retreat yeah. um, is something that usually once people have kind of had a had an experience of yeah. that yeah. Um, it's a good thing to do say once a year or so yeah. um, for me personally I am a little bit more addicted than that so <laughs> yeah. it's a very unique experience isn't it because it's not quite a it's not quite a getaway it's not quite a spa mm. break um, and it's not therapy one-to-one uh, -one therapy either so it's very very, very uh, yeah, a unique experience. Mm. Um, so tell me a little bit about, if you can, your experiences with one-to-one -one therapy and mm. good and bad. <laughs> so I suppose if I think back to my earliest yeah. experiences of therapy, um, I remember going to a therapist around 12 and feeling very... Um, on guard actually like I was being questioned about things and I think my defensive nature was very much up uh, and not really finding a, a connection or really understanding why I was there or how talking about things would help me I'd got very good even by the age of 12 very much kind of pushing things down and, and being very closed not being willing to be open to to speaking with anyone, uh, particularly an adult feeling like kind of people were prying mm. into my private life. Mm. Um, so that's probably on the, the bad end of the, of the spectrum. Um, at the moment, I am doing some great work. Um, it's a type of therapy called mind clearing, uh, which um, is really fascinating, looking at kind of aspects of uh, attitudes that we kind of put on and where they come from the root of those and so mm. that's been really such an interesting process mm. to recognize um, how we kind of carry around these little aspects of our personality that are not really us but kind of defense mechanisms that we mm. can put on against the world <laughs> and how did you find that therapist actually she was somebody that i met on a enlightenment right. retreat yes Yes. Yeah. Uh, and so she had written the book. She'd literally written the book on mind clearing. And I thought, who better, who better yeah. a person to go to yeah. than uh, the person that's written the book yeah. on it? So. And do you still meet frequently, regularly, as in once a week? Yep. So uh, at the moment, I'm around every other week on Skype with her mm -hmm. actually and online for us works really well. I, mm. I also see a lot of people online and actually yeah. in terms of being that being able to fit into everybody's schedules and um and mm -hmm. keep regular contact mm -hmm. it's really useful and quite quickly you almost forget that the screen is there and and you can be mm -hmm. really in the moment with mm -hmm. that person so mindfulness i mean most people especially nowadays with with the proliferation of, of apps and and courses have heard of it but i don't think anyone can really tire of, of an example of it or demonstration how do you uh, use mindfulness in 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 your day-to-day -day life so i would always define mindfulness as having our mind full of what we're actually doing rather than filled with all the barrage of everything else that's going on in there. And so it's this thing of constantly coming home to where we are. Can I notice that I've picked up all this other stuff and can I just put that down? Can I just be here? And it is a practice because, of course, we forget and the mind is busy and it wants to take us off on all these journeys. And so it is this practice of constantly checking in, coming back, 
Um, but actually, uh, our emotions a lot of the time are a barometer for that. When we're feeling stressed or anxious, or we, it's usually because we've gone to the somewhere else. Actually, we're not being mm. present. And the more present that we can be, the more that we can recognise that and oh, let that go, come back to where I am. And in practice, how much are you able to be present on an average <laughs> day? Well, it depends, like everyone else, what is, what is going on. Yeah. But for me, certainly, I know that this regular meditation practice enables me to at least have that level of awareness of what's going on for me. And without it, I would be absolutely adrift. I don't know how people out there are managing. Mm. <laughs> it's been such, it's such a saviour for me. So, mm. And well woven into the fabric of, of your life by the sounds of it. What, mm. other, what, what other well-being tools would, would you uh, incorporate into, into your life? So movement. Movement mm -hmm. is really important we we live in a world where so much of what we do it has this up out quality we're constantly on devices we're very much up in our heads thinking all the time or looking at screens and actually we can become very detached from our bodies i see a lot of people with a whole host of physical issues and, and weight issues because of this sense of of being kind of a, a head really and, and this body almost being a bit of a an inconvenience and so this embodiment of of who we are in this physical mm. version of ourselves is really important and for me actually finding a way to use our body that is this expression of joy actually isn't it wonderful to have a body is really important and so dancing I absolutely love to dance and it makes me feel alive and um, and actually that's a big part of my practice and even when I'm stressed at home or things are kicking off and there's mayhem with the kids I think sometimes the most important thing to do is whop up the music have a dance around the kitchen really important and um, I have recently very much got into five rhythms. Have you ever done any five I've rhythms? I've heard of it, but if you can <gasps> expand on it, I, I will benefit from it, as will our, our viewers and you'll, listeners. You'll have to come with me to Vauxhall. So um, it is basically moving through different rhythms that, 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 we, that we move through from flow to staccato to chaos uh, to lyrical into stillness and they, they call it like a wave, you're riding the waves of these movements and uh, it's, it's absolutely wonderful to really find the rhythm of the body and actually lose that self-consciousness and to just really be in the moment feeling the music and it really releases the most incredible feelings, the, the endorphins and something more, this sense of being really connected to the body, this, this real embodiment. Mm. So you've got the music, you've got the activity, presumably you also have the, the social side, the, the kind of the community doing it with yeah, others. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. So there's a, usually there's a, there's a great one called Sweaty Thursdays uh, in Vauxhall uh, on, a, on a Thursday night. And there's usually about 100, 100 of us wow. there. Um, wow. Yeah, which is a wonderful feeling absolutely incredible and to be in that space and with that's alcohol free um is a it's a wonderful wonderful thing mm, okay so speaking of alcohol free anything on the diet side that's important for you in in general well-being terms so listening actually mm. really listening to the body and uh, I teach many people mindful eating. I run a, a mindful eating course that I teach a lot one-to-one -one. and learning to really listen actually because we have this incredible piece of equipment that actually gives us feedback all of the time if we're not so busy up in our heads but we're tuned into physically what's going on for us 
there's always these messages from the body, you know, I'm full, uh, actually I'm thirsty, I'm not even hungry. And really being tuned into that means that actually we can nourish ourselves in a way that's most appropriate to us. It's almost mm. not needing to adhere to somebody else's version of a diet. But actually, it, when we really learn to tune into that, um, we know, almost, you know, we get this sense, oh, I need some spinach, actually. I need some, uh, some, this kind of nourishment when we get really tuned into that. And it's, it's so interesting, this learning to, to listen to that. It sounds very individual as well. Yeah, absolutely, because there isn't one way that is right for everybody we're yeah. all individuals spinach doesn't work for spinach everyone spinach does not work for everyone <laughs> um and are there any kind of uh anything that's very requested that people work on is weight loss very topical for them or any other kinds of presenting issues that they come to you specifically for namely are you noticing any themes or trends digital overconsumption, mm. etc I think something that is very strong is anxiety. Mm. In, in younger people, I'm, I'm getting more and more mm. younger clients mm. with just terrible anxiety. And, and obviously, social media and screen time clearly feeds into that. Mm. Uh, within slightly older age group, mm. um, Alcohol is is a really big theme and I think that actually more and more all of a sudden people are really kind of waking up to how much they're actually consuming mm. and being slightly more honest about that and, and recognising the correlation between feelings of anxiety that they're getting and alcohol consumption. Mm. And where can people reach you? and so, look up your work. So mindfullyhappy.com mm -hmm. is uh, my business, but um, people can read the book, which is You Are Not Your Thoughts, The Secret Magic of Mindfulness. And is that available on? So on Amazon, Amazon. Barnes & Noble. Congratulations. All of the Waterstones, all of the regulars. So, um, yeah. And on social media? On social media, yes. So um, dipping in and out of that. But yes, yes. It's, yeah. it, but it's really important to kind mm. of draw back from that personally. And so it's a wonderful way of connecting. But we all have to be mindful of how much we're yeah. using the social mindful media. Mindful social media use as yeah, well. Yeah, absolutely. So mindfully happy across everything, Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and also on YouTube. So yeah, lovely. Francis, thank you so much for joining us today. Really appreciate your insights. And I'm now, I, I'm now inclined to be more mindful, not only in my eating, but my general, uh, general kind of disposition of, of, of well-being as well. But I am hungry. So <laughs> <laughs> and spinach is coming to mind. But thank you so much for, for joining us and, uh, and contributing today. Brilliant. Thank you. Thanks. If you feel you'd benefit from therapy and want to transform your life, harleytherapy.com is here to help you book counseling with qualified professional therapists online or in person at times and prices that suit you wherever you are in the world. If this is your first listen to Therapy Lab, do hit subscribe to keep up to date with new episodes. You can find us on iTunes, Spotify, and listen at harleytherapy.com forward slash therapy lab. We'll see you next time.